On the night before my first day of high school, I remember going to my sister and telling her that it would be the worst experience of my life. Now, for context, my sister wasn't one I'd go to for advice, given that up until a year prior, she loathed my existence. So I was surprised by the wise words that she departed to me. She told me that high school wasn't like it was in the movies, that I wouldn't get bullied or shoved into a locker or beaten for my lunch money, nor would the popular kids make fun of my appearance. She told me that if I was determined to believe that high school would be hell, then it would be. Now, if this were a movie, a camera would zoom into my face and the background would have blurred out, and my dramatic facial expression would let even the densest of viewers know that my sister's wise words had suddenly encouraged me to be optimistic. But this wasn't a movie. So there was no camera zooming into my face and no epiphany to be had. I went to school the next morning with the idea that it would be akin to mean girls and cyberbullying. And so day after day after day, I slowly became a little more dead inside. There was no joy to be found within those seven periods and piles of homework. It wasn't until I met Mr. Hallett that the idea of school being something more than something that drained the life out of me became a possibility. I remember early on in freshman year, there was a seventh period assembly on vaping. And why I remember this so well is because freshman year, my seventh period class was geometry. And I was upset that no one had told us beforehand because I was doing absolutely horrific in the class and needed all the time I could get with my teacher. And during the speech they were giving, I had taken notice of a tall ginger haired man who was wearing khaki pants and a button down plaid shirt and had vaguely recognized him from a photo my sister had of them together in his office. Now, he was too far away for me to see his face clearly. And even if I could, my facial recognition is horrible. And so, I stared at him for the rest of the assembly. And when the assembly was over, instead of going up to him and doing the normal thing and asking, hi, are you Mr. Halleck? I instead walked up and down the aisles trying to catch a glimpse of his badge. And when that didn't work, I left the auditorium and waited and waited. And when he finally exited, I caught a glimpse of his badge, confirmed that it was him, and then debated within myself for like five minutes of whether I should even bother introducing myself. I did, and the interaction went something a little like this. Hi, are you Mr. Halleck? Yeah. I'm Amelia's younger sister, Camelia. Oh yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Now that moment is within my top five most embarrassing moments. And not because of him, but because of my inability to look this man in the eye after I did sort of just stalk him. <laughs> so I was a zombie, but I had some decorum. I could interact with people, I could do homework, I could eat food, and instead of having to resist the urge to eat people, I had to resist the urge to fall asleep anywhere and everywhere, which, if I'm being honest with you, failed because I fell asleep in the cafeteria every morning before classes started. I was a zombie, an intelligent one, but still dead inside. It was caused by my lack of passion in school and the things around me. And then COVID became a problem, one that no one believed would reach America, but then it did. And then the world shut down. Initially, the school had given us two weeks off, but then two weeks became four, and four became six, and six became eight, and eight became summer. And at first, I was happy that we had that time off. I got to sleep in, I didn't have to go to school, I didn't do schoolwork, and I wasn't forced to see people that I didn't even really like. But the isolation led to the Great Depression. The Great Depression is what I dubbed my COVID experience. Humans are social creatures. Some like a lot of social interaction, some like big gatherings and parties. Others like me prefer small, controlled social interactions. And so it took a while for me to realize that the isolation and the only interactions between my mom and sister was eating away at me. And when I realized that it was eating away at my mind and my heart, that is when I truly became a zombie. And so freshman year was over and sophomore year was on the horizon, and it was scary for so many other different reasons. October 19th, 2020 found me scrolling through my school Gmail, and I came across an email titled Club Opportunities. And within this email, there were four clubs. One of them was the Shaker Bison, which was a pleasant surprise because at the time, I was mourning the death of Knitting Club, the only club I had joined my freshman year because of the not real social interaction. I could be in there and knit and no one really wanted to talk. And it was a good thing because I wanted to write. I wanted to share my voice. But instead of going to a meeting willingly, I closed out of the tab and moved on. 
And the only reason why I even managed to go to a meeting was because I mentioned in passing of my interest to Mr. Halleck. Now, what Mr. Halleck did, some people would call encouragement. Instead, I decided to call it bullying me for my future growth because I am dramatic and a theater kid. I joined the Bison in late October and I began my first piece around the same time. But it wasn't until January that it would be published. The piece is called, well, the question is why? Why would I ignore such a big interest of mine? I have three reasons. One, I didn't consider myself a writer at the time. When asked if I was a writer, my knee-jerk reaction would be to say no. And after a while, it stopped being a knee-jerk reaction, something I believed wholeheartedly. And this perspective that I held about myself began to poison the water I was drinking. And I became sick, sick enough that I managed to convince myself that if I assumed the title as a writer, I would be taking up space for people who are more brilliant, more creative, and simply just better than me. And so I confined myself to only writing essays that were signed by my English and history teachers and stayed within those stiff academic guidelines. I was convinced my writing wouldn't contribute to the world. I'd like to say that I've gotten over this notion that my words must have a purpose, but I have not. I don't want to write anything that is posted and it's glanced at by two people and they forget about it the instant they scroll or close a tab. And so I didn't bother writing because if my words have no purpose, what is the point? And my words felt it's significant, so I didn't. I didn't write. Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is defined as a psychological occurrence in which an individual doubts their skills, talent, or accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. When I finally decided to step out of my box and write things that were besides school essays, when I started sharing these pieces of writing, I remember I couldn't accept the compliments I was given. Between the, oh my gosh, this is so good and you're such a great writer and you should write, I couldn't help but think liar. I couldn't accept those roses that were being given to me. I had this constant persistent fear that if I said, thank you, yes, oh my gosh, yes, this is what I want to do, that another girl with my name and my face would jump out of a corner and accuse me for stealing her words. This isn't something I've gotten over. In fact, in the process of writing the speech, specifically this part, my hands were shaky and my palms were sweaty and I could barely even type out a word that was spelled right. But I have, cope I have coping mechanisms. Sometimes it's blessing music or it's texting a friend and asking, hey, does this sound good? or it's simply just writing and, and ignoring the voice that sounds so much like mine. I joined the Bison in late October, and although I started my first piece around the same time, it wasn't until January that it was published. It is titled, A Message Everyone Needs to Hear, You Are Not Alone, inspired by the musical Dear Evan Hansen. Now, I wrote this piece not because I wanted to hear what people thought, I'd somewhat gotten over my fear of not having a purpose, that my words didn't mean anything. And I have a bad habit of forgetting that when I write something after it's finished and I turn it in, I completely forgot about it. So after I sent it in to be edited, it wasn't until a few weeks later that I remembered that, hey, I wrote this, that I went on the Bison website and checked. And I found that I had five comments. I'd gotten one from Mr. Halleck, my sister, my mom, my English teacher at the time, Mrs. Wilson, and one of my mom's coworkers. And as I said before, I didn't write this because I wanted to hear what people had to say. But nevertheless, when I saw those comments, I couldn't help but be filled with joy. And so I went on the website every day and read those comments until I could memorize them and recite them from memory. I wrote three more pieces before the year ended. And with every publication, I slowly began to be transformed from zombie camellia into the person you see standing here before you today. Since freshman year, I have joined around six more clubs. I have co-assisted and directed my fall plays, and I help with the costumes for the spring musicals. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to be recruited into a program called First Amendment, First Vote, which explores civic engagement with young girls, and got invited to Governor Hochul's inauguration. In my sophomore year, I was recommended by Mrs. Wilson to join the Writing Center, and although I prefer small, controlled settings of interaction, I sit one-on-one -on -one with students and help them build their skills to become a better writer. Now, it may sound as if I'm brandishing my success before you all, and in a way, I am, 
But I don't do it because I want your roses. I do it because 14-year-old zombie camellia would have never in a million years have stood on this dot. But I'm here now. And I can't say it's because of me. All that work was because of the teachers, Mr. Halleck, my sister, my mom, the friends that I made in the Bison and the Writing Center all pushed me to be here today. So what I'm trying to say is, for my fellow zombies in high school and in the real world, wake up. If you don't have someone in your corner, make me that person. My course teacher, Mrs. Kimbler, says, if you have a small number of people in your corner, you're set. I can be that person if your corner is empty. Make this speech become the catalyst to the death of your zombie and the reawakening of you.